Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. I am your host, Mike Joke. I'm joining me this afternoon from Delcoin Racing is engineer Olivier Boisson. Olivier, first off, how are you doing through the quarantine time? Hi, yeah, no, just doing pretty good, you know, just trying to stay busy and, and stay positive and, and try to look forward down the road to go racing again. I definitely understand that. Only only a couple more weeks until we are or to, until most people are back at the track. So over the next couple of weeks, I know you, you might not be able to be in person with everybody getting work done, but are you guys starting to ramp up preparations for Texas with a lot of online meetings and, and the likes? Yes, definitely. Yeah, we've been, in fact, since, you know, after St. Petersburg, we've been uh, doing that and having some some meetings online with all the other engineers and start, you know, planning a little bit. It was a bit hard at first, not knowing what the schedule looked like, but there is still so much we can do, you know, a little team like us with, you know, more time and more things to do than, than people. We definitely try to treat that time like an extension of the winter and, and just trying to look down the road and try to do all the things we never have time to do in general. Yeah, I understand that. So before we dive into some more racing talk, I, I have to ask because it's been a fun quarantine question right now. Have you come up with any fun or uh, maybe not so fun new quarantine hobbies to pass the time when you aren't working? whether it be watching Tiger King or James Clint Hinchcliffe the other day told us he was going to try to juggle but hadn't gotten there yet. So there is a wide range of possibilities to answer this. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I have plenty of hobby in general, which, you know, normally I don't really have time to get done during the racing season. So I've been, you know, as a French guy, I guess, it's, you know, I've been cooking a lot and trying to do a new thing, a bunch of new recipes and, and things like that. And, uh, and you know, gardening, be able to get my garden never look so good, be able to plant on my tomatoes. And uh, also, I was able to walk for the first time in many, many years. I've got an old 73 Chevy Nova resto mode I was trying to get done and be able to do a bit of walk there. So that, that keeps me busy for sure. I love all of this. So before we talk about current day IndyCar and, and everything going on with Dale Coin Racing, how did you get your start in motorsports? What led your your interest into becoming, you know, on the engineering side of things, and uh, what led you eventually to Dale Coin Racing? Well, that was that was a long route. Um, basically, it all started back in France. I mean, from a young age, I was always, you know, interested in like mechanics in general and working with like mopeds and cars and engines, and and uh, I was lucky enough to you know go through some different schools and and meet people who got me interested in racing. And um, long story short, you know, I ended up working for some Formula 3 team in France and going to a school to be a race car mechanic and, and you know, got lucky to be able to do one race going to Finland for the World Rally um, with the driver Sebastian Loeb, uh, who was not very famous at the time yet. But, you know, and then got me pretty excited about rally and racing and, and then got the chance to come in the U.S. At the time, I was supposed to be for six months and now it's been 16 years. So, you know, it's been a, a long journey, but, you know, make my way through it and work with a lot of interesting people. And lately got able to work again with Eric Cowden, a very good friend of mine. And it's been really fun. Awesome. So has there been anybody along your motorsports career that that you've met that you were starstruck by maybe either a driver or somebody on the, on the business side of things. Yeah. I mean like, uh, and it, it became a very close friend is, is Sebastian Bourdais basically, you know, came, you know, from France, not knowing much about, you know, champ car at the time. And, you know, having that guy, you know, who won the championship many times. And, you know, then I got to meet the guy and I was a bit, you know, at first it was, you know, like, oh my God, I'm meeting, you know, the, the champion and, and it turned out we're really, really close friends now, and, you know, going on vacation together and, and it's been really fun. That's awesome, man. So I'm, I'm sad Sebastian won't, won't be on, on the team this year, but happy he's still, still an IndyCar. So 
Last year, I believe, was your first year working with, uh, obviously, wor- working with uh, rookie Santino Ferrucci, and I think you're working with him again this year. So how did he surpass expectations last year in 2019? And do you think he has another level in 2020 to become a maybe a race winner? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I was very impressed. You know, like you never know when you get a rookie driver, you know, you always expect, you know, people coming from Europe like that, like you've been racing, like they will be okay on the street course and road course. And, you know, all those guys are very fast at any given days in general. But the really good surprise, you know, was the oval. We, you know, we show up in India not knowing anything and be like, okay, I could, you know, we just need to finish. And, and it was, you know, amazing to watch and really fun to watch. And, you know, watching him walking with Pancho Carter on, on his hair. And it was like, it was like a really fun season on the Oval in general. And, and I think this year, you know, we want to keep that up on the Oval and we just need to qualify a bit better on a road course and street course. And, you know, he's got the speed. There is no question there. We just need to make everything a little bit better. Awesome. So with Texas coming up in now just a couple of weeks and you've had now a three plus month layover since the spring, uh, spring training in, in Coda. Is there a a way you're approaching Texas and maybe a more conservative setup just to you know get some laps in, finish the race, get some good points, and and keep going? Or how are you guys approaching the uh, first race of the year? Yeah, I mean it's definitely you know going to be a little bit more conservative of the whole because normally you know on the regular schedule would have had Indy by then and you know having everybody up to speed and even our teammate on the overall and having you know different the car prepped up and, and everything a bit different where here Texas has been the first race changed things a little bit haven't got really time to test there uh, you know with the aero screen and you know there's so many unknown that being like a content schedule with a one day we just don't want to do anything stupid and just you know, we want to finish and, you know, we have some really good driver and if we can give them a pretty good and safe car, I think we can do some good things, but definitely going to be sure we don't, you know, we don't go too far off the field on this one. Is there any concern with a kind of smushing Texas into one day from, you know, from, from your perspective, from an engineering perspective on how, how the day will go? No, I, I think, you know, Personally, I kind of enjoy the challenge of, you know, having to make decisions quickly. I think that's part of the fun of racing is is you have a, a dead set time and you have to come up with answers really fast. And I, I kind of like working under that kind of pressure. I think it's it's really fun. And if you have, you know, too much time to, to get the answer, and I think sometimes, you know, you can, you know, you can give it a little bit to the bigger team if you, you know, can make a few good moves and don't let those guys with all the resources try to figure out the answer. So I kind of like that, but for sure we just have to be, you know, careful in the way and methodical in the way we're going to approach it. Definitely understand that. So I'll switch gears here and, and steal one of co-host Jess' questions since I she couldn't join us this afternoon. If you were able to invite three guests to dinner, whether they are dead or alive, who would they be, and and why would you want them at your dinner party? Wow, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say Anthony Bourdain because I really enjoy watching the show and I think he was a very great character and, and I like to eat and, you know, <laughs> I would like to, to have a lot of opinions of what, what he thinks about different food and, and, and things like that. Um, and racing-wise, I would think I would have, you know, Senna because, you know, he was, you know, I think that would be really cool to be able to talk to him about racing and what racing used to be in the older days and, uh, and I would say another interesting person would be maybe Nishi Mouton. She was like a race driver in the Group B rally car era. And that's something, you know, I really love those cars. It was really fun to watch them. I think it'll be some really interesting conversation. I love it. That's a great list there. So you mentioned, you've mentioned rally car a couple of times. And I know that's a little bit bigger over in Europe than it is here in the States. What makes rally, I, I enjoy it, but what makes rally car so interesting and, and so exciting to to those who maybe haven't watched it before? I think it just, you know, the, the format in general and, and those race on those open road, I mean, they are closed, but like there is no much fencing and trees everywhere and, 
and the risk and speed those guys are taking. I mean, it, it's more like a time trial more than just racing versus each other. So it's a different style of racing. But I think the proximity of the trees and the cliff and, you know, just make it, I think, a little bit different kind of danger. I mean, it's every racing have its danger, but I think it's 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 a different thing. And when you watch all those videos on those 80s group B car, when you have people in front of the car jumping off as the car, you know, fly by. It's, it's, it's just pretty insane. Yeah. I would highly recommend anybody who's listening right now to go to YouTube and just search for a rally car in the, in the eighties and, and you can see some wild stuff. It looks like people are about to get run over all the time there. I think safety's come yeah, a little crazy. bit of a, a safety's come a little bit of a way since then, I would say. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I know at Dale coin, this year, you and Eric Cowden are kind of co-running the engineering side of things while he's mainly focused on Alex Pillow. But I'm sure you've had some interactions with Alex and, and seen him testing so far. So what can you tell us about IndyCar's, one of IndyCar's newest rookies in Alex Pillow? Yeah, I mean, I, I was there last year when we had to test with him at mid And right away, I mean, I was very impressed by you know his work ethic you know his speed his feedback you know it was you you can tell he's you know racing is his life and he treated it like a job and he's very motivated by it and um yeah i mean his feedback for the first time in the car at you last year was very impressive and, and how fast he could up to speed and and the speed he was able the lap time he was able to achieve was was just pretty impressive and you know Two days later, after the test, you receive an email with the whole report. So, you know, he sent type all the notes at night and send us all the notes and feedback and changes. And, you know, that was just super professional and just very impressed by him. So after his first day of testing, he went to you guys and said, this is all of the changes I want on the car for the second day of testing? Yeah, he was he was commenting of all the changes we did for the first day and then saying, you know, if I had to run again, this is what I, I think I would like to try and go and you know, it was it was just very impressive. It's just, it's, like I said, his feedback and 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 you know his his calmness in the car to be the first time in an Indy car at Midway. And Midway is a pretty you know pretty fun track. So, it, you know, he did he did very well and impressed all of us right away. And um, you know, it's kind of pretty happy we can have him in the car this year. I think he's going to do great alongside Santino, and I think it should be a pretty interesting pair up. Yeah, I agree. Two two young guys who really seem like they have a good grasp of. IndyCar racing in, in relatively limited experience. So with the schedule kind of not, you know, most of the schedule is confirmed, but obviously everything can change day to day to day right now with the COVID-19 virus. Does that make it more stressful for an engineer to maybe plan for a race that's coming up and, and not knowing if it's actually going to happen? Does it throw a, no pun intended here, throw a wrench into any of your plans? Yeah, definitely. So we've been, you know, me and Eric and, and the rest of the engineering group, I mean, you know, a lot of discussion of trying to figure out, you know, the timeline of things and, and try to walk smart to the point where we try to delay a lot of things and work on other things that for sure is going to happen or later in the season or development for the future to try not to have to work on something that's all of a sudden has been cancelled and wasted all that time working on it and planning so it's definitely we're trying to wait as long as we can to, you know, for the thing that's coming close to us and try to more right now take care of, of like bigger things. And hopefully like that, we can work, you know, more efficiently. I definitely understand that. So on the same note there with the Indy 500 and associated practices and qualifying and, and whatnot being later in this year in, in August, where it can either be relatively nice weather out in Indy or obviously probably relatively hot and humid. Are you kind of doing some advanced planning for Indy like teams typically do already in advance of the hopefully August Indy 500 date? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're already prepping, you know, the cars for Indy. We have, you know, normally we set chassis aside just for, you know, the 500 and we've been working on them and trying to get them, you know, as nice as we can and, and on on engineering side, we're definitely looking at, you know, all the different options weather-wise and, you know, it just gives us a bit more time at the end of the day to look at all the aerodynamic data and, 
you know, there is a lot of unknown with with the, the aero screen and the limited testing this year. So we, you know, we're trying to do some work with simulation, trying to understand things and, and plan ahead as much as we can. Makes sense there. So I'll wrap it up with two questions here, both sort of aero screen related. With the iRacing IndyCar Challenge wrapping up, did Alex or Santino come to you guys with any thoughts on either sight lines from the aero screen? I know it's a little difficult because it was a game, or maybe how they felt the car handled maybe differently from last year. I guess that would be more of a Santino comment, but any thoughts on aero screen and, and how it's changing the characteristics of the car so far? Yeah, I don't know if we can really take, you know, like from the eye racing, we didn't really get any feedback from those two guys on that. But from, you know, the, the Sebring testing we did before the season and, and the Coda test and, you know, Alex at Texas, we definitely have a little bit of idea how much it changed things. And Santino seems to like it compared to last year's car. He liked a bit more the way the weight transfer. I mean, it's a bit heavier car, a bit higher CG, and and I think for him he likes the feel of feeling the weight getting transfer to the front tire. So I, you know, Santino seems to like it, and Alex, I guess, doesn't know anything better right now. But uh, they both seem to get along with it pretty well, and and the cooling or the vision haven't been an issue so far. And you know, we had a bit of test in the rain. Uh, at Coda and both those guys seems okay with it and so so far it seems pretty pretty painless on our side from your know, testing and, and everything you've done so far with the aero screen how much change in setups and and overall you know setting up setting up the car have you either had to do or do you plan to do with what you you know what limited information you have so far yeah there's definitely you know a, a step on the setup we have you know beside the continuation of evolving our general setup philosophy in trying to make the car faster. We also have now to account for the fact the car is heavier, the CG is higher, the weight distribution is different. So that changed uh, the way we set up the car quite a lot. But also, you know, now we, you know, we we have to work with a partner at Firestone, and you know, those guys are making you know some changes on the tires to help us, and we're just trying to work with them to understand what those changes going to be. So. Um, so we can make better decision from that. Awesome, man. Well, listen, I appreciate all of your engineering insight on, on everything going on right now. It's been really, really fun to talk to you this afternoon. That is all I have. So Olivier, thank you very much for your time. Stay safe and best of luck in 2020. And, and I look forward to seeing you out at the track when we are all able to return in the near future. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it too. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You too. Bye-bye.